Please be seated. Your Excellency, Madam President, what a great joy, Katalin, I may say, what a great joy that you have come to visit this university. And as a welcome gift, our choir has something prepared for you. Your Excellency, Madam President, I present to you the students and faculty of ITI Catholic University that come from all over the world. All uh, continents are in fact represented here at the ITI. And it is such a great joy and such a great honor that you have accepted this invitation. And I don't want to talk too much. I want to present here to the audience the President of Hungary, Katalin Novak. Maybe I should stop now because I won't be any more popular uh, at the end of my speech. Uh, Anyway, Christian, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for offering me this opportunity of meeting these uh, beautiful young people here uh, in, the, in this room and for offering me the uh, chance to share with you some of the thoughts I, I brought with, with, along with myself. The occasion why I am here uh, today in Austria is because I have uh, or I had 
an official meeting with uh, the president of Austria, uh, Van der Ballen, uh, and, uh, and that brought me uh, here uh, to, to Austria today. And uh, when you got to know that I come here, then, then uh, you invited me here, and I thought that uh, uh, even if it makes my day quite long and tomorrow early morning I am taking off uh, to go to Canada, Toronto, I, I wouldn't miss this opportunity of meeting you and uh, trying to share with you uh, some of uh, the thoughts I have. Uh, um, which is not easy because uh, I thought what, what I have to talk, talk to you about, uh, either uh, about uh, Hungarian history, about uh, trying to give you a more reasonable uh, picture of Hungary than drawn by the international media, let's say, uh, which has more to do with the reality as uh, most of you can read in the newspapers. Uh, shall I tell you about our freedom fight back uh, 66 years ago in 56, when uh, so many died uh, for the freedom? And uh, just uh, these days, 66 years ago in October, we're still the happy days uh, for the Hungarian revolutioners, but just after some days, uh, on the 4th of uh, November, they uh, lost or their, uh, their uh, hope in, uh, in gaining back their freedom. I uh, yesterday just participated at the commemoration uh, in Mosul Magyarovar, near the Austrian-Hungarian border, uh, where uh, there was a mass uh, shooting. Uh, the peaceful uh, revolutioners uh, who wanted to remove the Red Star from the different buildings were shot dead, uh, more than 100 people. And we commemorate this event uh, each and every year in Mosul Magyarovar. And uh, it is so important uh, to give over to the younger generation what happened uh, uh, due to the communist era, uh, also in Hungary. And I had the chance to meet somebody who actually survived, who was there, who herself was shot and whose uh, brother was shot death, death, uh, dead uh, just besides her. And now she's in her 80s, and uh, she's this, this great uh, old lady is able to tell you the story what happened 66 years, 66 years ago on the 26th of uh, uh, October in Mosul Magyarovar so precisely. She told me that she remembers everything, each detail, but she doesn't remember what happened five minutes before. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, it, I mean, five minutes ago. Uh, so it's just, uh, just one option to, to speak to you about our revolution in uh, 56, uh, how we always uh, fought for freedom, how we Hungarians uh, define ourselves as uh, freedom fighters, uh, what is our common history with Austria. I could also tell you about the importance of bringing uh, West and East together, which is also, I know, uh, one of the aims of uh, this very university. Uh, I could also uh, speak uh, to you about uh, uh, the actual challenges we face internationally, uh, and the first place, of course, the war in our direct neighborhood uh, in Ukraine, and, uh, and what my thoughts are uh, about this. Uh, uh, and if you have any questions, I will, of course, try to answer them uh, in that sense as well. But, uh, but I thought that uh, I will speak to you about family today. Uh, and the family in two senses. Uh, one is what we call in Hungary a family policy. I don't like this expression so much because it's not really a policy. It is uh, just really putting families in the focus. But it is something which, let's say, happens on the macro level. Uh, in Hungary. I will try to, to, to draw you a picture about uh, this. Uh, and, and family on a micro level, uh, which means uh, what, what means family for a person, what means family upon my understanding for me personally as well, and, uh, and uh, why it is uh, such a basis for, for my personal life, just as for our communities. So what I will speak to you about today is, is family. Uh, and uh, well, I, I don't know how much uh, uh, you know about me, just a very short uh, introduction. I've been president of Hungary for a little bit more than five months now, busy five months, uh, and four and a half years to go uh, in, in the, this uh, first term. And um, uh, I, I was uh, elected as the first uh, woman president of my country 
uh, also the ever youngest, which is not a merit, it's just a fact. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also as, as a mother, a mother of uh, three children. And, uh, and for me, being a mother, this is uh, the most important part of my life, being the wife of my husband and also the mother uh, of, the, of, of our three children. So that, that is just a personal, short personal introduction. I had the privilege uh, to work for Hungarian families uh, for almost 10 years uh, in the last decade. That means I was responsible for introducing a family policy, I, I call it again a family policy, uh, in Hungary, which, which was something uh, completely new and uh, something not really, let's say, mainstream uh, now in, uh, in either Europe or in the Western world or, or in the developed part of the world uh, at all. Uh, what does that, that mean? That uh, we think in Hungary that we really have to put the emphasis on families and strengthening family values and strengthening traditional family ties. Uh, and uh, it means that uh, on one hand, we would like to enable young people to have as many children as they want to have at the moment when they want to have these children. We don't want to convince anybody. We don't want to persuade. We don't want to push. We don't want to intervene in anybody's personal life. But we would just like to enable. If I raise the question, I won't raise it because I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable here in that room. You all know each other, and I don't want to confront you publicly with this question. But I, if I raise the question, uh, and you don't have to answer publicly, but just in yourself, uh, if, if I raise the question, if you want to have children in the future, uh, and just think about it, and uh, you have your answer, and if yes, how many children would you like to have, then you also have your answer. I am wondering in 10 years time, if I raised this question again, how many of you would answer that I have at least as many children as I wanted to have at the beginning? Uh, and. Uh, if I also asked the question to you, do you know when you want to have these children, then maybe many of you couldn't answer. Because it's, you know, it's, just, it's just an idea, it's just a dream, it's just a plan to, to found a family. But we have so precise uh, plans for so many things. You know what you will do that day, you know what you will do next day, you have the calendar maybe all year long. And you also plan your professional career. You know which university you want to choose. You know which profession you want to choose. You may also know to which firm, company, or I don't know, public administration uh, you want to join. Uh, but uh, I think a uh, few of the young people have actually a plan in their heads of, 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 of really having a family at a certain period of time and uh, having one, two, three, or even more children at a given uh, time, time frame. And um, uh, what we would like to do in Hungary is, that is, is really to, to, to make young people also think that over. And, uh, and if they have their, this plan, then to enable them to fulfill this plan. Because what we experience in Hungary, and that's not uh, only a Hungarian phenomenon, it, it, is, uh, it, it goes to each and every part of the developed world, there is a so-called fertility gap. Uh, what do you call a fertility gap? Fertility gap is actually the difference between the number of desired children and the number of children that you will have at the end of the day. So if I raise this question, how many children you would like to have, and like 10 years later, I would ask the same question. The difference between the two numbers would be the fertility gap of this group. There is actually a fertility gap in the whole developed part of the world. That means that in each and every country, young people would like to have more children than they will have at the end of the day. And that is why states have something to do. Because uh, unless uh, we decrease this fertility gap or, or completely uh, erase this fertility gap, we still have uh, some tasks to ful fulfill. Why don't the young people have as many kids as they dream to have? Uh, why cannot they fulfill these uh, dreams about, uh, about, about family life? That was the question that we raised uh, over 10 years ago. And that's, why, that's when we started to think how we could create, in the first place, an, uh, let's say a legislation which is supportive to childbearing, to traditional families, and the second place to have uh, 
family support schemes that financially also support uh, families and childbearing, and also uh, third, how we could create a family-friendly atmosphere in Hungary, where you really experience that uh, living in family is just something most natural. Uh, so that these are the three main points. And uh, uh, for that, you, you, I won't, uh, uh, just as I told you uh, at the beginning, I won't go in detail into the Hungarian history, but I will tell you something about the Hungarian demographic uh, uh, situation in Hungary since uh, 1981, so for, for over four decades, uh, the population has been decreasing. Uh, the population has been decreasing by over 10% uh, in, in these uh, decades. So that means that each and every year in Hungary there are more, more people uh, being, uh, uh, less people being born than those who die that same year. Each and every year we lose some part of our population. The fertility uh, uh, ratio or, or the total fertility rate in, in Hungary, so the average number of children per family, it was 1.23 in 2011. So it was very, very, very low. And uh, uh, we started to create this family-friendly environment. That means that we have, for example, introduced a pro-family uh, or pro-family parts, let's say, of, of our constitution. For example, our constitution is very clear uh, about the definition of uh, families. That means that uh, a marriage, that uh, upon uh, our, I, I can also quote you, uh, if I want to be very precise, what our constitution says about uh, uh, marriage and families. Our constitution says the following, I quote, Hungary shall protect the institution of marriage as the union of one man and one woman established by voluntary decision, and the family as the basis of the survival of the nation. Family ties shall be based on marriage or the relationship between parents and children. The mother shall be a woman, the father shall be a man. Uh, every human being shall have the right to life and human dignity. The life of the fetus shall be protected from the moment of co conception. Uh, these are uh, all quotes. These are all, all quotations from, from our uh, constitutions, and, uh, and we, we, we were cri criticized for that as well, uh, for each and every sentence, of course. Uh, and if, when I asked back and I asked that, what is the point of criticism, then why don't you put uh, in your constitution that the sky is blue and the grass is green? And I said then, okay, we are fine, because you also think that that is so evident, that uh, as the sky is blue and the grass is green. So I think these are just evidences that we also have in our constitution. But I think that you, many of you might uh, experience that in these challenging times, it is uh, useful to, to have these evidences set clear in your constitution. And these are highly uh, supported by the Hungarian people. Uh, so we have legislation, not only our constitution, but we have different laws, cardinal laws, and all kind of different laws which protect families and which support uh, uh, family support, family protection and uh, and uh, and uh, family support schemes. Uh, so that is, let's say, the legislative part, which I think is indeed very important. Uh, the second, which I told you about, I won't go into details. I could tell talk about this for hours, but I won't. Uh, this, is the, this is how we financially support uh, childbearing. Because, you know, when you want to have a child, well, it costs a lot of money. It's, uh, it's true. I mean, it's a costly thing. Even if, uh, if you are not in an, in, a, in an underprivileged uh, social situation, even then, uh, raising children, it costs a lot of money. And uh, uh, we, what we want is to give support to everybody who, who, is, who raises children in a responsible manner. And that means that uh, we linked uh, family, be family benefits to work. So the precondition is that you work, that you contribute yourself, that you take part in the society. It can also mean, of course, that, for example, if uh, you are an educated person and then you give birth to a child and then later on you stay at home with your child, 
uh, it is, of course, it means also that you work, you contribute yourself. And in Hungary, there is a, a parental leave of three years. So you can stay at home three years long with the child. No matter if you are the mother or the father, it is not exclusive for the mothers, it's also for the fathers, so you can share these three years uh, with each other. But you have the chance, you, uh, you have, I would say, the privilege to, to spend these very, very important first three years of your, of your child's childhood, uh, early childhood, uh, with, with, at home with the kids. But you are not forced to do that either. You say that if you want to go back to the labor market, you are free to choose that, and you are still entitled for the family benefits. Uh, or, or you can do both at the same time. We have a daycare system. Uh, we also introduce something which I find quite unique and, and important, that is a so-called grandparental leave. It means that in many families, uh, you would have grandparents who, who, who would be ready to, to be there with the kids, to raise the grandchildren. Uh, they are still uh, not in, uh, in, in pension, so they are not retired. They are still working. Also, the parents are working, and they don't want, wouldn't like to, sp to, to send the kids uh, into day daycare, but they would take advantage of being at home with the grandchild. You can do that in Hungary, actually. So even the grandpa or the grandma, well, more, more often the grandma, can, can uh, uh, take advantage of, of staying at home with the grandchild. And uh, I remember once when I still was just a, a state secretary or minister for families, and I met uh, one of my counterparts, I won't name her, uh, and she told me how, how, how much of a challenge it is for them that uh, grandparents don't really take part in the families anymore. So children don't really have the experience to meet regularly their, their grandparents. I personally had the privilege to meet each and every of my four grandparents every single day. I was so, really, so privileged to, to, to be able to do that. And uh, uh, most of the kids don't have that. And so this, uh, this minister just told me that, well, unfortunately, they, they, they see that these uh, multi-generational families don't, don't faction like that anymore. So she was very proud because she said that they introduced a new model, a new scheme. That means that there is a group of different uh, professionals, like a psychiatrist, a social worker, and I don't know, some others, and they take care of the child. So it's very good because then they can substitute the uh, grandparents, and so they can solve this problem. But you cannot substitute a grandmother. I mean, it's like, uh, not that you just uh, have a scientist or, or a psychiatrist or, or a social worker who will substitute the grandma or the grandpa or, or, or the parents. It's, uh, I don't think that's, that's, that's just, uh, you know, a dead end, dead end street. And that is why when we see all these challenges in Hungary, we don't say that, that you have to find out something instead of grandma, but you have to find a way how you can still have the grandma and the grandpa in the family. I don't, I don't say that it is very common in Hungary that uh, multi-generational families live together and, uh, and they every day meet and, and, and share the time together, but still there is a chance and we don't give up and, and, and again having these multi-generational families, we even give them support if they want to uh, build a, a house together, for example. Uh, and, uh, I just would like to, 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 to give you some examples. As you are uh, members of a young generation, uh, maybe you also experience, you understand what it means when you want to start your, your, your pri private life or so together with somebody, you want to start your real life, let's say, and you dream about having a, a family, then there are so many financial burdens that, that it's so difficult you know, to, to say that, okay, but uh, how will I have an, an apartment or even how will I be able to, to rent an apartment in which a child can fit in? Or, or uh, how, how will I be able to raise the child from a financial perspective? Will I earn enough money? And so on and so on. And so for this reason, we introduced, for example, a financial scheme, which means that it, it is called a baby expecting bond. It's, it sounds weird in English, but it says that you, you are entitled uh, to a certain amount of money, which is like with this uh, current uh, uh, exchange rates, I don't know it anymore how many euros it would be today, but uh, it's around uh, 30,000 euros uh, that you can get uh, as, as an, 
a little bit less now, but uh, around, okay, let's say 10 million forints anyway, you can get uh, as, as a credit, but it's a credit without an interest rate and general purpose credit. So you can use it for anything. And uh, you start to reimburse it, but once the first child is on the way, then you don't have to reimburse for three years. Once the second child is on the way, then, you, then we write off, decrease your credit by 30%. Your 30%, you don't have to pay back ever. And if you have your third child, as a couple, married couple actually, then you don't have to pay back anything anymore. So you just can keep these 10 million forints and uh, you, you could use it for anything. Plus you can get another 10 million forints in order to build or buy a new home if you want to have a large family or you already uh, have a large family and so on. I could tell you many, many of these uh, uh, financial schemes which we have introduced in Hungary. Just one more is that, no, two more. One is that uh, if, you, if you have four children as a mom, uh, you don't have to pay any personal income taxes ever in your life. So you are completely exempt from personal income tax paying lifelong with four kids or even more. Anybody can move to Hungary, it's, it, it's, it's an option. <laughs> and uh, the, the other one is that as you are students, and uh, some of you might also pay uh, uh, tuition and also might have a student loan, uh, if you have a student loan in Hungary as a woman and you will have children later on, then after three kids, for example, you don't have to pay back your student loan at all. But already at two kids, uh, we write off 50% of your student loan. So it's, it's again, some, some benefits. If, 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 you, uh, if, you, if you study, if you work, if you contribute, and in the meantime, you, in a responsible uh, manner, you, you decide to have a family and raise children. So the idea is just that. And it means that um, I'm an economist, so I, I, I like numbers, sorry for that. But uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the the shares of the GDP. Uh, let's just pick an example. In the NATO, the target is to have 2% of your GDP spent for military purposes. Uh, in fact, in Hungary, we have 6.2% of our GDP for family support. So it's 6.2%, uh, more than three times as much as uh, you normally should spend as a NATO ally uh, for military purposes. And uh, I don't even call it an, uh, an, an um, uh, a, 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 let's say, an, uh, oh, how do you say that? No, that, but kiadash. Uh, expenditure. Expenditure, that's sorry. How, uh, uh, the, I, the whole day I was speaking different languages. I'm sorry, I'm now quite completely mixed. So uh, is, you don't, we don't, I don't even like to call that an expenditure because I don't think it's an expenditure. It's an investment, actually, in our future. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we are very, very strict in, in preserving all these, uh, these family uh, benefits and trying to help uh, those who, who, who raise children and who, who decide on having children. And that is not uh, what I want to, to mention still is, is uh, it has something to do with uh, the, the protection of life. Or it's, it's that uh, if uh, you, uh, you, have, you are pregnant, uh, the baby is on the way, we actually, uh, after the 12th week, we consider this baby identical to the born baby. So that means that you can have all the family benefits identical after the 12th week uh, old uh, uh, not unborn baby, just the same way as you have after the born child. So it is also just a way to, to demonstrate uh, that, uh, that life begins uh, already at conception and, and that child is already there. So we we'll, we'll really, really, uh, consider this unborn uh, child a child. And um, that was, let's say, the, the second part, the, the financial benefits, which we have really a lot. Uh, but, but it's not, not, I don't say it's not the most important, who can tell what is the most important, but uh, that's just one part, what, one other important part uh, of what uh, we, we try to give to the young people and the families. Uh, so there was the, let's say, the legislative part, then the financial schemes, and the third is this family-friendly 
environment or family friendly approach. Uh, when I, I could take a look uh, uh, right now uh, in the different parts of this uh, beautiful building and I saw this uh, cry, crying room, crying room, just uh, what you have, for example, that is, that is also something like that. I mean, if you, if you just uh, think of those who have children, that, is, that just means that uh, you don't have to feel weird if you have a baby on your, in, on your hand. Uh, and, uh, and it's not only that, it's not only with babies, with small children, but it is also with elderly. Because uh, many, many of the, let's say, middle-aged generation face now the problem that in the meantime, they have to take care about their children and their parents. So two generations at the same time, and they have to, to somehow face this double burden of uh, trying to, to, to take, take care of both generations. And, uh, and there we also try to, to, to help and try to speak about the difficulties, uh, the challenges, and uh, try to, for example, uh, introduce family-friendly workplaces, uh, family-friendly prizes for, for companies uh, who introduce such measures and so on and so on. So to create a family-friendly environment. And many tell me it's interesting that uh, they come to Hungary and uh, they experience that they walk on the streets and they, they see young couples walking with, with little children or babies or the trolleys, pushing uh, the trolleys uh, with babies. I just uh, was in the United States not long ago and uh, I went jogging in the mornings and I saw even trolleys, uh, young people pushing trolleys, and I looked into it and I saw dogs in it. So it was quite weird that, uh, and of course I'm not speaking against dogs, I don't have any, so it's not, I don't have any problems with dogs, I love dogs, we have two dogs, but it's, it's just, I mean, I, I, I was lacking babies. Uh, and. Uh, and, and the, I, I think and I believe that uh, if, if uh, that there can, so that this can change, things can change, and, uh, and that can, could also be a uh, fashion in a positive manner, that uh, if, if you can really somehow uh, underline uh, the importance of, uh, of, of childbearing, traditional families, uh, child raising, uh, and, and family values in general, then, then it can be, become more and more attractive for young people as well. Because, you know, if you experience that none of your friends have children and they go to different places, they go out and they do things that you couldn't do with a child, then you don't really have the mood to, to, to do something else and to choose another path. But maybe if you just experience that, wow, this friends of ours also have children, the, the others as well, and they, they also uh, organize programs where kids or babies are welcome, then you might also start to think about uh, uh, why, why not to choose the same. And, uh, and, and in Hungary there are some positive signs. I, I don't say uh, I'm quite reluctant in that sense, so I don't say that, that the trend has turned and, and everything is now so uh, pink and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's now it's fine, but that there are still positive signs. I just tell you some uh, results, uh, some numbers. For example, the number of marriages. You know the tendency. In the Western developed part of the world, number of marriages go down, number of divorces go up. In fact, in Hungary, in the last 10 years, the number of marriages doubled, and in the meantime, the number of divorces is at a 60-year low. So there is a tendency which is completely contrary to what is happening uh, in general. And uh, another important element is that the number of abortions in the last 10 years halved. So it dropped to the half uh, in 10 years. That is, again, a positive sign that uh, with education, with uh, emphasizing the importance of a human life, you can reach uh, uh, results. So I don't think that we are there yet, but, uh, but we, we have uh, positive uh, elements or positive results. So that is, let's say, the big picture. Uh, that, is, uh, that is what we do uh, on a macro level in Hungary. And then comes the micro, uh, which will be very personal, if you allow me. Um, 
I am a mother, uh, and and uh, I would say that what I do right now, being a president, I I enjoy my job a lot. I, I like it. It's it's great. Uh, still, it's my plan B, uh, because I always wanted to have a fourth child. It's uh, uh, it, that's that's what I wanted uh, really. And my husband, he said that well, three it was nice enough, but uh, nice but enough. Uh, so he, so he he said. It's, it's, it's now it's okay. And then uh, I went back to work and that's, that's how it turned out that I, in 10 years I became a president. And uh, it means that, that uh, uh, for me, having children and, and raising children, this is just such a, such a uh, I wouldn't even say joy, but it, it is just really the meaning of, uh, of, of, of my life. And what I would like to, to personally tell you, it's not an advice because I, who am I to advise you anything, it's just my personal experience, is that uh, um, you're, 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 I think, as, as a young, I speak about myself, I don't speak about you, I will speak about my own experience. Uh, when I graduated from university, uh, I entered the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, I start, started my diplomatic work, and I felt like, you know, really eager to do something. Like, after so many years of study, now I can really deliver. I, I, will, I will earn some money. I will be independent. I will be, I don't know, I will be somebody. It's, I, I was really, really, I had this, this feeling that I wanted uh, to work. And, uh, and then we had to take a decision on either having a child or going to a posting uh, somewhere uh, abroad for four years. And uh, then we started to think about it with my husband, and then we decided that uh, we'd rather have the kids right now, and later on we can still go anywhere. Uh, and, uh, and that was a difficult decision. It wasn't easy. I mean, even looking back, I know it was difficult. It, it wasn't that evident that I always knew I wanted to. I always knew I wanted to have kids, but not now, not right now, just a little bit later, just after I fulfilled something, I, after I finished something. Uh, and then I had to, to decide that, okay, now we will have the children. Not I had to decide, we had to decide. And so we did. And, uh, and, and, and that was, and the other two, these were the best decisions of our life. And uh, what, I'm, uh, what, I, what my experience is, and what I am telling you is that uh, uh, the, the picture I see is that if you have two trains uh, on a railway station, and the, the one is your professional life, the other one is your, your family life. The second train, the family life, it is, it is like really a very fast train, which, uh, which, which, is a, which is like a Japanese train, which is super fast and also goes on time. And, and leaves the railway station really on time and won't ever stop just off the schedule maybe won't ever stop again. And, uh, and if you miss it, you missed it. Uh, and that's it, you can never catch it again. The other one, it is like, uh, well, I'm sorry, not for the media, but uh, it is a Hungarian type of train or the traditional <laughs> Hungarian type of train, which is, uh, which is nice, uh, uh, but may, might not re really leave the station on time. It can also happen maybe a little bit slower, uh, and maybe it just stops from time to time. Uh, so it means that uh, either you are at the railway station and you, you don't even want to catch it anymore. It can also happen. Or you, you, you will catch it and then you will decide if you want to move forward to the very first car even, if you want to. Or maybe you find a very nice seat and you sit down and you, you, you feel comfortable in that train, and, uh, and you can still catch it. You won't miss it. Uh, even if you think you miss it at the railway station, then you will just move a little bit further and you will find it again if you want to find it still. So my experience is that this, this train is just so much different from, from, from the first one, from your family life. And, uh, and I, I, I would always regret on, on, on missing uh, uh, the first train. And, um, and I, I don't, I don't uh, regret that, that we took the decision with my husband that I spent six years long uh, with ho at home with the kids without any uh, public commitment. And these were really so meaningful uh, years of my life. And I gained so much experience that I uh, can 
take benefit of uh, in my professional life as well. So this is just uh, my message to you, my personal experience, uh, and, uh, and maybe if, I mean, I, I wanted to hear this story all the time when I was in my 20s, and nobody told me this. And I just then decided that if I will have the chance, if I have the chance any time to, to, to tell this uh, to, 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 the young, to young people, I will always do so. And if there is just one person in the room who, who, who for who, whom it makes, it makes him or her think, uh, then, then it's, it's already worth it. So Christian, uh, I won't, don't want to take any more time. I mean, I am there to, to answer any of your questions. Uh, I'm really privileged that I, I could meet you today and uh, I could share my thoughts with you. And uh, I very much hope that uh, if I raise the question 10 years from now, how many children you have at the end of the day, then maybe it wouldn't be a fertility gap, but it would be a fertility surplus. Uh, you never know. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Madam President. Thank you, Kathleen, for your testimony that, as you know, I didn't hear for the first time, but it never fails to inspire me. So I'm sure that many here in this room will have that same feeling. I would now like to invite you uh, to answer some questions. The way we go about this is that there will be uh, two uh, students um, will be standing with microphones, and I will uh, point to the person who can ask a question. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, state your name and the country you are from. And once again, as I already informed you before, no statements, please, brief questions. We are here to listen to the president, not to ourselves. So please uh, guard that discipline. Um, and before doing that, I also wanted to warmly welcome Mr. Ambassador, my friend, uh, Mr. Ambassador to uh, Austria of Hungary. I'm very happy that you have also come along. I just saw you sitting there. I didn't see you before. So I'm very happy, <laughs> Mr. Ambassador. So, uh, Kathleen, if I could ask you to come up front again, and I will be then. The first question is from Fabio. The microphone, please. He can have a statement as well, maybe. <laughs> He's a Dominican. Köszönöm elnök asszony. Nagyon szépen köszönöm az előadást. Tudtam, hogy jó lesz. Most tudom, hogy jó volt. Zsajvatja vagyok. Francia vagyok, de már 12 éve Magyarországon lakom, Sopronban, és már találkoztunk tulajdonképpen egy pár évvel ezelőtt. Sok tennivaló van, családja is van, ami nagyon fontos, sok ideje pedig nincs. Nagyon szépen köszönjük, Isten hozott. My question would be, when we enter Hungary, we see at the border, written officially, family friendly Hungary, welcome. You said also, during your talk today, things can change. What would you say to us, especially to our students? What can we do, what can they do in order to promote a more family-friendly society? And I mean, not only to get married and to have children. Mm -hmm. Köszönöm. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, well, these, these signs, uh, yes, if you, if you come to Hungary, if you arrive uh, to Hungary at the border, you have this sign, but also at the airport, for example, you have the signs, family-friendly Hungary. It was actually my idea, I have to admit it. Uh, and this, this is because uh, it, is, it, is, it is really a, like a, a message that uh, you enter a family-friendly country and hopefully you will also experience that it is a family-friendly country. And I think that, that 
that is already uh, at the moment when you enter it and you realize it that it makes you think that, oh, why should a country be family friendly? And that's already the point, that it makes you think about it. And the, uh, your other question, uh, how can you contribute to having a much more family friendly environment is, is that I think it's just, for, for me it's simple, you have to be brave. Uh, because uh, uh, sometimes, I mean, nowadays you, you need to be brave in order to speak for traditional families. It is not very common, it is not the mainstream anymore. Uh, even if it's, uh, if it's so natural for us, it is so evident for us. So I think that uh, you constantly have to, uh, I wouldn't say, of course, if I wouldn't say the, the, the word that evangelize, in, but in that sense, as, do that. That uh, you, you spread the message of the importance of, uh, of uh, families and you, you, you have your testimonies yourself. I think that is the most you can do, actually, because you can have organizations, you can, I don't know, you see, there are concrete things, of course, that you can do, but I think that in self, that's really spreading the message bravely. That's all I would say. Thank you. And thank you very much. It was really inspiring. Um, I have one question because you, you yourself said money is not. I'm so very sorry. My name is Jan Liduchowski. I'm from Austria, Vienna. Um, you said yourself money is not everything. So it's more about culture. So my question is how did you change culture? Which means what did change with the media? What did change with TV, cinema? We are in a competition with Netflix, with Amazon Prime, with Disney, and so on. So is there even a possibility that we as, as, as nations, as cultures, can win this competition? How did you do that in Hungary? Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, I don't know if you won. <laughs> we are still, still fighting. Uh, but uh, uh, what, what we, we did, it's just some examples what we did. For example, also we had uh, pub public cities, uh, actually. Uh, for, for families. So it was also part of my job. I, I, uh, I was responsible for, for finding this out. And for example, we, we financed uh, short uh, TV spots, for example, or even articles and, 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 uh, and ads uh, in the newspapers, which were just about family values. It's, uh, it's nothing, you know, you, you're not s selling a product, you're just trying to sell this uh, feeling of, of uh, family. And, and that's, again, that's not, uh, that's not a rosy picture that you draw that while well, everybody is happy and everybody is together. I mean, on a daily basis, I know, I mean, you know, in the, in the different uh, TV uh, pubs, for example, uh, or, or uh, these, uh, uh, yes, pub, yeah, spots. Yeah, these TV spots are usually you see. For example, when you want to sell a margarine, what happens? Everybody is in the kitchen. The whole family, everything is super clean and nice, and the kids are also very neat, and the parents as well. And they are chatting like I don't know hours long, and they are spreading the margarine and the bread, and they are happy. And so you sell the margarine. Well, and what happens normally in a family in a in in a usual morning? Well, okay. <laughs> Even if the kids are dressed up, that's a good thing. It's then you are lucky that everybody is uh, somehow on time. So, it's it, I don't know. It not, never actually happens to us that we spread the margarine like that. So it's not not, not what you have to show because nobody would feel familiar. Uh, but uh, but for example, we had different ads for for uh, uh, for, for advertisement for for example for for. Uh, uh, siblings, let's say. So that means that we, s we said that uh, that how important it is to have brothers and sisters. And we just, you know, we sh we showed pictures. And now, uh, and and I also learned how difficult it is to to make this like twenty second uh, or thirty second uh, TV spots. It took like a half a year to 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 make it to produce it. But uh, the other one was about the importance of uh, fatherhood, uh, how important to put is, it is to have fathers in the family, and, uh, and so on. So things like that, yes, we had that uh, with all these ads, advertisements. And uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, other than that, uh, what, what I think was just one more element I would tell you, Jan, is that uh, uh, it, was, it was, I think, the key step that we declared in Hungary that raising children, it is the responsibility of the parents. And this responsibility shouldn't be taken away from the parents. It should be preserved for the parents. And, and that's it. If you let the parents raise their children, then, then I think you have, you have a chance to restore traditional family values. But if everybody else wants to raise the children and tell the parents what to do or not to do with the kids, and also uh, take away the responsibility of raising them, uh, I think that you, you will then destroy traditional families. So preserving the, the responsibility of child raising for the parents, that would be my answer. Your Excellency, my name is Eleonore Wittering. I'm the mother of six children and also the director of the Center for the Study of Political Islam in Austria. And thank you for the um, family policy and thank you also for the Islamic migration policy of Hungary. And maybe it's due to the historic uh, Islamic um, oppression which you um, experienced. And my question is, do you see any possibility how you could influence other um, governments of the European member states um, with, with these policies which you have. Thank you so much. Uh, well, first of all, we don't want to influence anybody uh, because we don't want to be influenced by the others either. So it's, uh, we very much respect the, the sovereignty of each and every station, nation because we want our sovereignty to be preserved and that's the, for us important. But of course, to share the experience and uh, to make them think. Uh, I personally do that all the time. Uh, as, as before, as, as a minister or state sector, I did that as well. And, and, and even now, I... For me, it is so difficult to understand that in Europe, can you imagine that none of the European states has a fertility rate which is above two? So none of the European states has right now a fertility rate of a replacement level. None of us. So it means that in each and every country, country that is a huge problem. And we don't even speak about it. I mean, we just speak about the potential consequences or the answers which could be given to that because, well, legal mass immigration, it is an answer that if, even if we don't admit it, this is an, a legitimate answer. Even if you like it or you don't, that sh can be an answer. We didn't choose this path, but at least we, we don't just have to speak about the consequences and the treatment, but we have to speak about the problem itself. And I keep raising this issue and putting this on the agenda. But for example, next year, uh, in March, we always have a so-called CSW, that is the Commission on the Status of Women, which is the, the UN's second largest event. Uh, we had the UN General Assembly right now. I, uh, I, I represented Hungary there. But next year, I will go to the CSW. Normally, no presidents go there, because that's about the Commission of, on the Status of Women. And nobody speaks about families. They just speak about different women's issues. But I mean, what would be the most important if not families? So I will just go there and speak about families. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that is how we can raise awareness. And uh, that is how we can at least provoke some kind of common thinking about the importance of uh, underlining the importance of uh, or, or the, 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 use, the, the need for, for, uh, for supporting traditional family values. So uh, that's, 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 I think, uh, the way how we can do it. And also just one more element is that uh, as a president, I initiated a network that is a network of family-friendly presidents. Uh, and I would like to uh, resemble those presidents who are ready to, to, to speak up uh, for families. It doesn't necessarily mean that we all have to agree on the, uh, let's say, value uh, base, basis or, or on the definition of the family, uh, but it's just to accept that, that family is the cornerstone of our nations and the cornerstone of our future. And, and, and uh, when I, I, I hear and see all these uh, 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 
discussions about the protection of our environment, which I think is of utmost importance. But my question is all the time that uh, who do we want to preserve the, the planet for, if not for our children? So unless you have children, you have future generations, there is no point in speaking about anything else. Uh, that is why I, I, I keep fighting for, for having this, uh, uh, this topic also high on the agenda. Thank you, Madam President. I am Andrei Gozia from Romania. Thank you very much for your personal uh, testimony. I was uh, wondering if you could uh, share with us how you balance now your family life with your professional life. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I when 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 I. Here the question that how you know how how difficult it can be to to manage a family large family life uh, once you're a president or how can you do it if you have three kids? Uh, my question is that how could you do it without it? That's what that's what I don't really get. If I didn't have the kids, the family, then then I cannot really imagine how I could manage my life because that is just just the same way as you have your smartphone. It's uh, when you go home, you plug it in uh, to the charger and, and it, you charge it. And the next day you leave in the morning and, uh, uh, and then you can use it the whole day. So that's how I, I work with my family, that uh, I go home, I put myself on the charger and then I leave. Uh, of course, it's not that peaceful <laughs> as, as a charger. <laughs> uh, and if you have a 14-year-old daughter, then... Uh, you <laughs> So it's 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 uh, it's not, it's, not, it's not that calm and 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 quiet, uh, but but it but it really uh, gives gives me meaning, uh, or gives meaning to to whatever I do. And uh, it is um, uh, I'm I'm also I I should also say that uh, I am in a much easier, better, more privileged situation than most of the people, because I am the the patron of my my own calendar. Uh, I, I don't have to obey to, to so many uh, things. Uh, uh, I can, I mean, I work a lot, but, but still I can find out how to, to organize uh, uh, our life. And uh, the, actually the difficult thing uh, uh, about being a, a woman president is not that you, you're not taken seriously in the international diplomacy or something like that. It's not true because, I mean, 90% of the presidents are man uh, and in, almost in the same age so if uh, if you have a 45 year old woman president it is it by per se it is more interesting than than usually but uh, so it's not it's nothing it has nothing to do with any intelligence or, or something but it, so it's not i don't say it's it's the, the 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 most difficult part the most difficult part is that you still have all your duties at home so for example when we, we moved uh, every, anybody, all, my, all my man colleagues, they said that, oh, okay, you are moving. And I said, okay, can you imagine what it means to move a family? It means that you have to take care of everything what usually you would have to take care of being a mother or a woman in a family. You have to keep in mind all the family events, birthdays, everything, and so on. And you, you have to, so still, you have to, to do what you do normally as, as, a, as a mother or as a as a, as a wife, and, uh, and and nobody would do that with, uh, instead of you, uh, and and that's sometimes sometimes that is that is uh, uh, not so easy to to manage. Uh, but I, I still think that uh, my life is nothing more difficult than uh, of most of the people who are working and having a family in, at, in the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. My name is Alfonso Moneno. I'm from Toronto, Canada. So it's very nice hearing that you'll be there tomorrow. So hopefully you can say a prayer for my country because one more serious question I want to ask you, aside from all the beautiful words of wisdom you've offered, um, 
How do you balance diplomacy, respecting the sovereignty of a nation um, who's a partner, while at the same time calling out human rights abuses? From my limited understanding, Canada is one of the three countries in the world where there's no restrictions on abortion, uh, China and North Korea being the other two. And so you are such an inspiration. You're offering such wisdom about family values. And as a young man who's about to be married, this is wonderful. I can't wait to have a family of my own. And so in my own country, young people are scared. Our politicians don't talk like um, they haven't spoken as you are doing this evening. And that's why it's an inspiration. But how do you then call out human rights abuses and encourage our government and our politicians to be virtuous and be raised higher? Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, in Canada, I won't have any official meetings. Uh, I'm not going there because of that. I will actually uh, go there because I am a reformed Christian and uh, we have the day, we celebrate the day of reformation and the 31st of October and we will uh, there uh, inaugurate a beautiful uh, building which uh, can resemble the Hungarian nationals uh, in uh, living in around Toronto, let's say. So that is the reason why I go there. Um, but I understand your point, and uh, uh, and I think, uh, I mean, again, I, I have to refer back to the fact that uh, uh, we have to really, do, we do, really do have to respect uh, uh, sovereignty, and we have to respect the the uh, sovereign uh, democratic decisions of each and every people. And uh, we do that, so that's why I don't have a say on any other country's regulation or, 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 or something. But uh, I, uh, without uh, avoiding the essence of your question, uh, if I understood it well, uh, it is about the, the importance of the protection of life. And there I should say that I'm a pro-choice person. If I say that I'm pro-choice, well, everybody would think that, oh, what does that mean that I am pro-abortion? Because normally pro-choice means in the international language, diplomatic language, that you are support, so you're a like pro-abortion person. I say I'm pro-choice because I'm for real choice. I am for really choosing between giving life or not giving life. But uh, once life starts, it's not the same uh, to choose anymore. It's, uh, that's, that's why I think that uh, uh, understanding the, the meaning, the importance, the value of human life, it is uh, just for us a, a lesson, not only to be learned, but also to be given uh, over to, to, to the others. What, what, what for me is, is, is difficult to understand, and I again refer back to the, let's say, to the climate change and the environmental protection issue. Um, of course we protect environment because we understand that we pollute the air, that we do so much harm for, for the environment, which we did, wasn't aware of before. We weren't aware of before. So we didn't know that. Once we knew, know uh, what, it, what it is about, then we have a, a logic answer and we say that yes, we do a lot in order to protect the environment. On the other hand, what I don't understand is that we know mu so much more about human life than we used to 10 years ago, a decade, or two decades ago, or a century ago. And still, the more we know about human life, the less we protect it. And that is something that I can hardly understand. Uh, I think that we just have to raise the awareness and the, the knowledge uh, level of knowledge and understanding among uh, young people already so that they be aware of the meaning of life and, and human life. And if they will understand and when they will understand uh, uh, that human life is already there, these, these, the fetus can already be get operated and, and they're, they're really uh, these... Uh, uh, new uh, uh, technologies, let's say, in science uh, that, that, that exist already. Uh, and, and still, uh, there is such a, a, a discussion about uh, when human life starts. And, uh, and so I think what we should do is education, education, and education. So we have to teach the young people as well uh, about human life. And I truly believe that once they understand uh, the importance and the beauty of human life, then they will protect it even more. So I think that in the long run, we should win this battle. And in the long run, everybody should get aware of uh, the 
importance and meaning of the protection of human life. Thank you, Madam President. Um, what would you say to... Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> my name is Rindu Shane, and I am from the United States. Um, what would you say to the objectors who would claim that such pro-family policies would lend itself to enabling irresponsible parents who cannot reasonably take care of large families and are only doing it for financial benefits? Thank you. That's why I, I always emphasize to raise children in a responsible manner, because uh, that is part of our, our, our policies, let's say, that to support childbearing in a responsible manner. If I put it very simple, we don't want to support those who have children for the money, but we want to support those who have children because they want to have children, and they need money in order to be able to raise them. And, uh, and that's the idea. And I think that the, the clue was actually to, to link uh, the family benefits to work. And once uh, the parents also have to work, have to contribute, uh, I, I think it is, it is a good uh, way to differentiate between those who really do want to raise their children in a responsible manner and those who don't. And of course, I said that uh, responsibility of childbearing, uh, child raising is that of the parents. But of course, if something goes wrong, uh, if the families break up, if uh, there is, uh, for example, uh, uh, in in the, in the family domestic violence or or anything like that occurs, then of course there has to be some intervention and there has to be some help delivered. So that is also an important uh, decisive part of what we are doing in Hungary as well. So it doesn't mean that all the families will function beautifully and uh, perfectly. Of course not, unfortunately not. But, but then uh, the church or the churches, uh, the, the family organizations, the local authorities, the, the uh, public administration or, or the governmental bodies should be there to, to, to help. So first you have to try to, to, to help those who really think in a responsible, in a responsible manner. And second, if something goes wrong, then, then you have to be there to, to help also afterwards. Oh, I'm fine. You're Still. fine. Okay. <laughs> the president said it. We're fine. We're fine. Um, I would like to uh, encourage. Uh, so far, only men have been. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to encourage our female students, of whom I think you're in the majority here. <laughs> here you have a great leader. <laughs> Please, ladies, I would like you to go away inspired tonight. Well, <laughs> um, so I, I really encourage. Um, our female students especially, to think of questions. While you think of your questions, let me take uh, one, of, one of the other questions. Um, yes, please, go ahead. Yes, stand up. And, um, yes, Leopold, can you give the microphone? Yes, please. Yeah. Madam President, thank you. I'm Luigi Felici from Italy and the United Kingdom. Um, just wanted to ask you, uh, in a slightly political question, is, um, it's pretty clear that uh, a lot of members of the European Parliament and certain member states of the EU have drawn a lot of criticism uh, towards Hungary in such policies that we were discussing about and a lot of the, cultural, the positive cultural developments that Hungary is going through at the moment. But Hungary being a, an EU state, what is, do you think, the role of Hungary has to play within the Union so far and if there is a role for Hungary? In well, the context of marriage and family, apologies. Sorry? In the context of marriage and family. If if Hungary has to play a role, I think uh, yes, uh, of course. I think uh, uh, as we are, we have been members of the European Union since uh, 2004. It's, it's been a long time already, and uh, so we are not in the first grade anymore. Uh, and uh, we know how we can uh, contribute. So we also raise issues. We also 
uh, reject some proposals uh, when they are against uh, uh, these values. Uh, I could even say that many times we can stop those proposals who are uh, contradict con uh, in contradiction to that. But also, which is important in the EU, that uh, family policies are in the member states' responsibility, and that, it, that should remain so. Uh, I think that it shouldn't be uh, something that we delegate to Brussels, or that shouldn't be a shared competence. There shouldn't be the competence of uh, the European Commission. That should remain in the good hands of the specific member states. So I say, I think what we should do the most is to, to, to try to, to stop any uh, attempt to take this responsibility out of the hands of the different member states, because then I think it would go to a wrong direction. Uh, so that is what we stand up for all the time. And of course, we can share good practices with, with each other, but I don't think that we should have this responsibility taken away from the member states. Yes, please, all the way up back. <laughs> Um, thank you, Madam President, for your speech. Uh, my name is Katiri Hauser, and I'm from the United States. And my question is about the virtue of piety. Um, so uh, here and at the previous school that I went to, we've learned that piety is a threefold virtue. So love and respect of your family, your country, and God. Um, and you've spoken a lot about, the, about family and the role that uh, sovereign nations play. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to how these relate to religion. So most of the people here come from countries where there are multiple religions. Um, and so it, how does respect of family or love of God and respect of religion play into um, government and protecting family and life? Well, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that, because that is such an important question. I also had to take the decision uh, what I what I will speak about to you today, and so uh, I I decided uh, not to go into that uh, part. Uh, but I'm happy for that for your question because I, for me, it is also an essential part. Uh, and and there I should make a difference between the role of religion and the role of belief. And uh, and again, let's say a macro level and a micro level, uh, b differentiate between the two. I think that. Uh, like, well, religious uh, freedom, it is just, uh, again, a key, and uh, to, to respect religious freedom, and, uh, and also what we have in Hungary, uh, that uh, the, the churches role, uh, play a more and more important role in, uh, for example, education, or even in, in social care or health care. And uh, I think education, it is, it is, it is very decisive. Uh, and uh, there are many schools run by the churches in Hungary. And, uh, uh, and these are very high level schools uh, in general and also popular. And sometimes uh, the children enrolled are not raised in very devoted uh, religious families. It's just because uh, they knew it's a good school so they enrolled their kids there. But I think that it, ha it also has an influence on, on the way of, of life of the f whole family. So I, I think it has actually a positive impact. Uh, and uh, to respect this religious freedom, I, uh, it is, and to let the churches do their uh, duties and their jobs, that's, I think, uh, the most important uh, role of the government in that sense. And, and then I can, can uh, speak about, the, the, let's say, the micro level, my, my own belief, uh, and then differentiate between uh, the religion and the belief. And, uh, and for me personally, uh, what, everything what I spoke about here today, it, uh, it, it cannot, uh, I mean, it, everything has to do something with my relation to God. And uh, with my professional devotion and my my professional my personal devotion and my per, my personal belief, and uh, uh, I I I myself I feel that uh, I would be much weaker. I would be much much less if I didn't have this conviction, and uh, if uh, if I if I didn't know that uh, that my uh, that the, that with with whom I have to discuss uh, the issues I have to discuss uh, uh, on who I can uh, count at the end of the day and to whom I am responsible to. 
so for me personally, that is, uh, that is a, a decisive element of my life. Good evening, my name is Matuš Hagara, I am from Slovakia. Madam President, I would like to touch on legislation of abortions and same-sex union in Hungary. In fact, since communism, abortions have been legal and same-sex uh, unions have been legal since 2009. It was the government of Ferenc Giurcani that approved them. Fides was against, but still the Fides in later time had the constitutional majority and the situation did not change, even with the constitutional majority in the parliament. So will Hungary follow the example of Poland where abortions are illegal, basically, and where no same-sex unions are possible? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. It is, uh, it is uh, more complicated than it seems, uh, but I can give you a very uh, quite simple answer. Uh, that is that uh, we are not planning any uh, amendment of the law on abortion. Uh, and it is because what I told you about the protection of life, that I think that uh, it's not uh, with raising uh, the tensions. Uh, it's not by uh, having this uh, discussion becoming uh, tougher and tougher uh, and bringing people out to the streets uh, and uh, having the this dispute on uh, legalizing or not legalizing or prohibiting or not prohibiting abortion, it is much more an education. And that, that is, some, that is uh, uh, up in my belief, uh, something that we really do have to concentrate on. And until now, as long as the number of abortions dropped to the half, just as I told you, I, my experience in Hungary is that it has an impact and, uh, uh, and that is, I think, how we should go further uh, still in Hungary. It is a very delicate issue. Uh, it, it is, I don't think that uh, the, the right step to be taken right now in Hungary would be to change anything in the legislation in that sense. I think what we should do is to, to put more emphasis on education and on teaching the importance of uh, uh, human life. Thank you. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will make my choice for one of our guests. Our last question. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Madam President, my name is Bernhard Zimburg <clears throat> and I'm a former Austrian diplomat. Um, unfortunately, I was never posted to Hungary, but I had a lot to do with Hungary in the framework of the Central European Initiative. Uh, Madam President, thank you very much for enduring uh, all our questions. Um, I'm uh, referring to what you said on the framework and the environment uh, for, for families. We in the, here in these countries are facing a fairly new challenge uh, coming from uh, Islam. Uh, we have a high proportion, particularly in big cities, a high proportion of, of uh, Islamic children, Islamic uh, uh, pupils, uh, and uh, we have, at first sight, it seems Islam is very much converging of what you were saying. Uh, a high uh, reproduction rate, a high fertility rate is certainly uh, desired. Uh, there's no question about the family as a cornerstone of society. Uh, where the difference comes in is uh, the politicization and the instrumentalization of the family for political purposes, in particular to turn the family hostile against the non-Islamic uh, society they are living in. And uh, my question now is, we have uh, uh, a social awareness of that here in this country, in particular in big cities, yes, but, uh, but there's very little uh, political response to that. So my question is, what about uh, the awareness in Hungary of that upcoming phenomenon? And if yes, is there any political response? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, well, honestly, uh, the reason why we don't really deal with this issue because we don't have the problem. Uh, that's it. So, so, uh, 
So, so it's good that we don't, uh, we are not confronted to that problem, but it's not by accident either. And uh, I think it is, uh, the question is uh, if, uh, if you're ready to respect the rules of uh, the community that you live in. And uh, I think the problems arise when there are different communities living together and they are confronted and the, the, the value basis or uh, the culture, the traditions uh, are, are, are so different and one is not uh, ready to respect the other and, uh, and not ready to obey to the rules which, uh, uh, which exist in a given country. So uh, we, in Hungary, for example, we, 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 we are a welcoming nation. Uh, we, but we also await everybody who wants to live with us to respect our rules, uh, the, the way of living uh, that the Hungarian people choose for their, themselves. That is how we do it in Hungary, and that and and uh, and we don't don't have this problem. So that is why we don't have a specific answer to that either. Uh, so thank you for the question, and uh, Christian, thank you so much for the invitation, and once again, thank you all. And uh, what, uh, what I would like to, uh, to, to tell you uh, at the end is that uh, uh, I, I envy you a little bit <laughs> because uh, you go to university where uh, you can really live freedom and uh, you can really enjoy freedom and, uh, and uh, you can also understand and feel that you're not alone, uh, that uh, you, you have others who, who share the same values as you do, and that can really give you braveness, that can really give you strength. And if you stick together, you, you, you preserve these, this network, you preserve these relationships. Uh, uh, you come from all around the world. You, you raised so many questions about the, the, the potential Potential, well, so <laughs> about how we will win these battles, uh, how how these traditional family values can uh, can uh, be safeguarded, and actually, this you are the answer. So if uh, if you uh, if you stick together, if you speak up for these values, uh, no matter what you will do in your lives, no matter where you live, uh, then well, you will actually be able to, uh, to drive us back to the right track. So you are very lucky that you go to this university and you have uh, very good prof professors and, uh, and fathers uh, who are there with you. And don't forget to pray. And for me, if you pray for me, then I am very thankful for that as well. Thank you so much. Dear Katalin, thank you so much, and we have a gift to present to you in gratitude for taking your time to share with us these uh, truly inspiring moments that I am sure will go into the history of the ITI as one of the highlights to actually, to have, may I just say that right here, to have actually standing in front of us a Christian married woman, mother of three children, who ask, who's the president of her nation and who closes to ask to pray for her. I wish that our Heavenly Father would grant us more such political leaders because then many things in the world would certainly go much better. So I thank you for this beautiful testimony uh, of uh, what it means to be a Christian and a leader in this society and the, the beautiful example of how we see that Hungarian family policies, which is so relevant for this university because we were founded by St. John Paul II who, for who the family was at the center and the heart of all he stood for. And in fact, he founded this university and gave it the assignment to specifically focus on the theme of marriage and the family. So your visit here and your testimony is very providential and, and, and really comes uh, at the right moment 
that we all need encouragement in all the battles, uh, all the battles that are being fought and our young students here are being prepared for that. So the gift we have for you, Kathleen, is a beautiful icon. I will be presenting it to you, but let me say two words about it. Um, it is, now here, I don't speak the Slavic languages, so please uh, forgive me that my pronunciation is not going to be perfect, but this is Saint Cislava, who is the patron saint, one of the three patron saints of this university, uh, but she's also the painter saint of married couples. And this icon was actually written by one of our graduates, uh, who's actually from Austria, uh, who actually was taught this here, and this represents this saint with three children. Uh, so she was actually the mother of, she was married, she was the mother of four children, and she was chosen by St. John Paul II to be the patron saint of married couples. So we thought, in light of the testimony you have uh, given us today, that this uh, icon should accompany you on your ways, and we literally took it out of the chapel. So it has, <laughs> it is an icon that has already been prayed with for a long time. And uh, we hope that as we give you this icon, and I'm sure it will have a special place wherever you choose it, it will remind you that you have here a community of Christians that will pray for you. So thank you. I also bought a small present, uh, that is a cross, that is a ha handicraft uh, from Hungary, and uh, a porcelain, and I think that, uh, I mean, you can never have enough crosses, uh, <laughs> so it, you, it might, you, you might find the right place uh, for it, uh, uh, and, and I really do thank you for your prayers, and I thank you for the invitation, and Christian, please uh, keep up the work. Uh, you as well, and also later on, the, your successor, uh, hopefully as well. Thank you so much once again, and please. So before we invite the president and her entourage for a small glass, uh, before she has to go back to Hungary, and we hope this will be an opportunity for some of you to mingle uh, with the president, uh, I would like to spontaneously ask Father Uri and some others to sing our usual hymn of well-wishing. This is very spontaneous, but we have beautiful voices here. And Father, maybe in two words you can explain this hymn that is a tradition at the ITI that we always sing for our guests. <laughs> May the Lord God grant long life and happiness to the servant of God, Catalin and her nation, and all those here present, long life and happiness for many and blessed years.